All right, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of the Change Within podcast. This is a platform to ensure that people are able to tell their stories from their upbringings to where they are in their lives currently. It is an interpersonal approach as far as how I communicate with the world at hand. And I'm very happy to have a first guest on this podcast, a very good friend of mine, Alex Albino. Alex, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic, man. Um, it's cold, warm in this house. They keep turning up the heat on and off. So, like, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going kind of crazy over here because of this. <laughs> I want to make up my mind whether to be hot or cold. So, in the words of Katy Perry, you have to be either yes or no. <laughs> yeah. Nonetheless, though. I'm happy to have you on this podcast because you have had a very interesting background as far as like your upbringing, what you've, what you've done with your life and how you're doing things today. And I was curious being that you're born and raised Brooklyn, what was it like growing up there? Uh, you know, I was born and raised in pretty much the bad areas of Brooklyn Right, like, and I'm still living there, unfortunately. Like, uh, I was born and raised. I was, I was born in Long Island College Hospital, but uh, I uh, have been most of my life in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and I just, I love Brooklyn. I just have been dying to get out of that area. Right, I'm not. Um, it's just uh, there's not a lot around there that I like you know, people wise, and especially now with COVID and all that, a lot of the few places that I used to like going to in that, in, in the neighborhood, they're, they're going by the wayside, like fast. But um, I've, uh, Brooklyn's always going to be my number one. It's always my home. And I feel like that's such an, that, see, that's an interesting premise in life, because when you actually are consolidating, you know, and kind of reflecting on where you've been growing up in your life, and you kind of evolve like what your viewpoints are as far as like, okay, I didn't realize I went through this, but as I got older, it's like, wow, I can't even believe I withstood this, but also not being aware of it at the same time. Kind of a follow up question to that is, do you feel like you've known the same people like in that Brooklyn area from when you've grown up? No, because I've mostly been in Sunset my whole life, but I've been to other areas of Brooklyn as time has worn on. Like um, I did move at one point in the like the mid nineties. With I lived in Bay Ridge for a little bit, right? Yeah. But the rent was too high, so we ended up moving back into the house that we were living in. It belonged, the house that we were living in in the very beginning belonged to my aunt. We ended up moving back in there. Then we moved to the place that I'm currently at now, right? And then and when I was in college, I moved out went to downtown Brooklyn. I lived there for about a year. And then that's when I took the, um, after that, I moved back in with my parents then moved to Texas for about a year. Then I came back and I, I've been like back, if I was back to sunset, then I moved in with my uh, ex to Bensonhurst. And then now I'm back in sunset again in the same place. So I haven't really like got to really know a lot of the people in the neighborhood and the few people that I did know while I was there, ended up moving out, you know. Now, not to jump, a, absolutely. Now, not to jump a little bit, but was the Texas ordeal uh, deprived, not kind of like derived, derived from the uh, from like the army when you were in the army for quite a bit? No, I I did that before I joined the army. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. How old were you when you went to Texas, though? Uh, well, let me see. I was like twenty. 23, 24 years old. I was just got out of college. Like, well, now let me say got out of college. I got kicked out of college. Right. So um, I had my uncle lived up there and um, I moved in with him because I was kind of getting sick and tired of the city for a little bit. Right. So I lived with him in San Antonio for a bit and I actually liked it up there. And I almost uh, I want I was going to stay there. I got you on that. So like when you were down like in that Texas area, what do you feel like were the, your biggest differences as far as what culture was like in Brooklyn for where you grew up versus like that area of Texas? Well, I had been to Texas before, like uh, 
for trips like during the summertime and all that. And so I kind of knew um, like the culture over there and I actually kind of like it a little bit, right? When I lived there, the big difference was my accent, right? They knew right off the bat that I had to be- The second from- you said accent, I was just like, yep, they're gonna know you're from New York. Yeah, and you do it right off the bat. And um, in the very beginning, they didn't like that, right? Because especially since I actually went down there with money. So they thought that I, I was loaded. And I'm like, no, I'm, you know, I'm a poor bastard that just happened to save my money to come down here, right? And my uncle, you know, helped me out a little bit. But uh, yeah, and then as time went on, the longer I lived there, and you can see it now when I come back, it slips every now and then. I somehow bred the two accents between Texas and Brooklyn together. So every now and then when you hear me say certain words, right, it comes out, right? Because I had someone tell me that I was like at a bar once and they were like, okay, make up your mind. Are you from the South or are you from Brooklyn? Right? You should have just been like, <laughs> no, I'm, like, I'm from Austin, Texas. Like, I don't know if you understood that. Yeah, no, I'm like, I'm from, <laughs> I was in San Antonio, right? But um, <laughs> yeah. No, they fucking like, um, they, yeah, it's, it's really, it comes out a lot when I'm drunk. Right. And I say certain words, like, uh, like when I, when I say son of a bitch, sometimes I say some bitch, right. Just like they say down in the South. Right. So <laughs> it, it comes out every now and then. So, and just for clarification on our friendship, I've gotten quite the load full of some of a bitch to the best <laughs> emulation of your accent on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, yeah. something something very unique about our friendship is I feel like I've learned a lot about like what your taste in music and movies have been and kind of to, to derail it off of like one particular individual. I'm curious, have you ever had like your first pop culture icon, somebody that you've looked up through throughout your childhood and kind of been like, wow, this is somebody who I could capture like some sort of their perspective as far as what I could learn for myself? Um, I don't know, my number one, you know, surprisingly, a lot of people would think it is, like he came later on, a lot of people would think it would be Sylvester Stallone because I'm a big fan of his movies and especially the whole Rocky thing where, you know, it's a um, underdog, you know, making his way up to the top, right? But uh, actually when it comes to like my first pop culture icon it would actually be harrison ford as indiana jones that's a curveball on after like yeah. nine years of friendship with you that's quite the curveball that's pretty cool though yeah no like i already had like a um a liking as a child right and this was due to my dad i already had a liking for like um the 1930s 1940s i love the cars and everything like that so my father introduced me to dick tracy Right. And that was actually the first comic book I ever read in my entire life before any oh, of the wow. superheroes. Yeah. It was Dick Tracy. I was first introduced to. Then he showed me Indiana Jones. Right. And I just thought like, you know, Harrison Ford's such a badass here and he's kicking Nazis asses and all that. And just the environment that he was in and the, the whole, um, you know, uh, how do you call it? Just the way he looked with the brown jacket and everything. Right. It made yeah. me, it, it not only did it make me want to uh, learn more about like history and stuff like that, because it was through those movies why I became so much of a history buff, right? And um, yeah, and it's just from the, after that, that's also where I got my uh, my liking for like wearing leather jackets a lot, right? I used to actually have, I loved it, and I don't know what happened to it. Um, I actually had the brown jacket that he that he would wear same type right wore that all the time um i don't know some point in high school i must have lost it or something or i got stolen i don't remember oh but, but that's yeah. like john travolta stripped from his career on greece <laughs> yeah <laughs> well like well i don't know stripped of his career <laughs> then he tried to make a comeback and do Gotti, right and that didn't turn out well Look, either. it's the one that he wants <laughs> yeah right <laughs> But yeah, no, it actually started with Indiana Jones and then from there it morphed to um, Sylvester Stallone with Rocky. And I guess like as time went on, I guess maybe Stallone took the top tier after that. 
because it always seems like a lot of the movies that I've seen him in and people give him a lot, you know, they make fun of his voice and they say that he's not that great of an actor. He's actually a pretty good character actor, but like, especially with Rocky, you know, starting from the bottom and working his way up to the top and getting beat all the time and just being able to stand back up after that. That's what I liked about him, you know? And you also see that kind of with Rambo too, like no matter what is thrown at him, he still comes out on top, right? He just never quits. And I like that, right? And you also see that with Indiana Jones too, he never quits no matter what, even going up against the Nazis, he never quits. So I like characters I can see like that, that in you, yeah. I could see yeah. like that connection. Yeah, like I just, I don't, I can never, I, I can't quit. And if I do quit, it's probably because I probably don't give a shit about whatever the hell it is. Well, I feel like that's the ultimate point as far as like if your heart's really in it because that it, it's going to come to that one second and it could literally take one second of you being like, I don't really want this anymore. And right. from that decision, it could literally change your world as far as how much you're willing to jump from one thing to the other. Yeah. Well, and then there's also times and especially I, I got this a lot when I was in the, um, while I was in the military you're going to be put in moments where you're going to have to put that kind of effort in, even if you don't like what the hell it is you're doing. Right. So I've been put in that position a lot. Right. And I've, you know, there's been a couple of times where I wanted to quit, but just like, just like in Rocky, I always have some kind of like, you know, like he has Mickey, right. Yeah. There's this scene in Rocky five where he says, uh, he gives him like the, uh, a cuff link and he's like this. I want you to keep it around you as some, some kind of like a little angel to give you motivation. And when you're down and you can't get back up, you're gonna hear me going and saying to you, get up, you son of a bitch. Right? <laughs> so it's like, I, I've been hearing that for a lot of the things that I didn't really wanna do, right? Even for dumb things, you know, like waking up from a hangover and I don't wanna go to the bathroom. I still hear the voice, get up, you son of a bitch. And I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's great. That's really yeah. funny. Like it was so kind of to kind of to make that parallel with like your army experience. What have been some times when you were in the army and literally that log line was kind of like embedded in your head? Do you feel like that was kind of like a constant 24 seven thing? Or were there things you were kind of surprised at yourself as far as how you were able to manage in your routine? Well, you see, it was, it was, it was different for me. Like, especially when you first go to basic training and all that, it's like a complete culture shock to everybody that goes in there. Right. And pretty much everybody that usually enlists is like anyway, between 17 with their parents' permission till about 20, 21. Right. So they're like a high school, college, whatever. I went in at 28 and I already had like somewhat of a discipline already because my father served, he was in the Navy during Vietnam. Um, well, three of my uncles served in Vietnam, right? Two in the army, one in the Marines, right? So I already had that like drive already. And once I got there, um, I wasn't really shocked by a lot of the things. It, I had the mentality of, okay, let's just get this shit over with. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I already know what you're gonna do already. The big challenge was where that, where, where you're talking about came in was when it came to a lot of the physical stuff because yeah, I'm a lot older, so I could tolerate and I understand how everything is supposed to be run. But physically, I was not in the best shape of my life. No matter what I did, I was <laughs> not gonna be in the best shape of my life, right? We're, and um, you got these kids here, you know, they're running, you know, the PT test or they're coming in at like, you know, um, 14 minutes, 15 minutes. That's like a good time to come in. Right. And me, I'm just barely making it for my time. Cause at the, you fall in an age bracket. Right. And you're supposed to do as uh, like, it's usually push ups, sit ups and, and a run, a two minute run. Right. And you're going to, and you're in a category, depending on your age, and you're supposed to do this amount of push-ups, sit-ups, or whatever, and it changes as you get older, right? So I'm like in the middle. So I have to do half of what these guys do and the rest, of, I don't have to. And I'm finishing all of it. I'm making it through, but I'm exhausted. I'm dead. I don't want to do many. I just want to take, go to sleep, right? But I can't go to sleep because I got a drill sergeant up my ass, right? Telling me to go back upstairs, come back downstairs, go upstairs, come back downstairs, wait here for about two hours, then go back upstairs. Now, 
I'm curious, just kind of like as another one-off question, as far as like you sleeping at base, like what's the most amount of sleep you've ever gotten away like night after night? Has there ever been a time where it's like, holy shit, I actually got six hours of sleep miraculously? Um, Sundays, because that was um, interesting. Yeah, Sundays. So that's like the, you know they let they let some of the soldiers go to church and all that, right? Instead of waking up at like zero zero five zero five thirty, they let let us go to like wake up around six six thirty. So um, depending on whatever happened the night before would determine what time we actually went to bed. And usually on Sundays, that's when people actually behave, right? Like Saturday on Saturdays, they behave, right? Didn't happen all the time, but we would be able to go to bed around like, you know, before lights out. Lights out was usually around nine, yeah, nine, right? Um, there were times where I just, I just flop into the bed after like coming out of the shower. Like, I don't care. I'm keeping all my uniform and everything on. I don't care if it gets all wrinkled. I'm going to just go to sleep like this. My, you know, I, I didn't care. And I would never make my bed. Right. I made it one time and I just slept on it like that. Cause I was not going to, <laughs> I was not going to go through the whole process of, you know, the, you know, you got to fold it here and then you got to fold it this way. And then you got to tuck it under the bed. I didn't and, even think of that. That's yeah. pretty interesting because I'm sure I'm sure as any like peer to peer industry kind of as far as if people are living within the realms of your lifestyle and if something's a little bit off for what they haven't been like anticipated to, I can only imagine like, okay, wow, th this person didn't make the bed correctly. I, I like, I'm sure that type of like language is there. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't even going to attempt to do that. I mean, I knew how to do it and I helped people do it and I did it correctly for them. But I was like, I'm not doing this every single night. If I'm going to freeze, fine. And if I'm not going to freeze, yeah. you know, I'll do I'll go to, I go to my locker, take my little fleece, go to sleep like that. And that's it. Right. I think maybe I only use like they had, they had like a little green blanket that was easy to put onto the bed. So I would sleep on the net, but everything else, I left it alone. And I was like, no. no. Right. And the only time I would ever have to uh, take it off is when we did laundry. Right. But uh, I got in trouble for this once. Um, I didn't do my laundry. I left it there. Right. And somehow the drill sergeant knew it. Right. He just yanked my the, everything off the bed, flipped it over and everything. And then I had to do everything all over again. Right. Knock my locker over. And it was just, <laughs> I'm just waiting for the I'm waiting for the millennial type of like rebuttal where it's like, look, I'm 30 years old and I live in inflated New York. Please don't blame me for this. <laughs> no, man, I, 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 I hate to think what it's like going to basic training now with these guys. because they, they changed the whole curriculum because of COVID, right? And I want to believe that it's going to change at some point and go back to the way it used to be because from the way I see it right now, it's vacation time for these people. Hmm, okay. Okay. Because I, when when I went in, you had you had three phases: red, white, and blue. Red is the initial um, phase where they're all over you. Like you, you 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 sneeze to the right, they're on the left. You sneeze to the left, they're in the front and the back of you. Right? That's their the drill sergeants all, all over you. By the time you hit white phase, that's when they kind of start. Um, they stop trying to break you down. They start trying to build you up, and they're trying to build like the team effort and all that. Right. And then the blue phase is when you just go through everything that you learn all over again, and then uh, you graduate, right? Well, I heard now that they added a third phase to it. It's called a yellow phase. And basically, it's just two weeks uh, quarantine, right? And I'm like, okay, where's the two weeks quarantine done at? Oh, it's done in these really nice barracks from the pictures that I saw. And I'm like, well, that looks like, and they get to keep their phones, right? They took mine away from me when I was over there. <laughs> they get to keep theirs. So... Mm. Is it, yeah, it isn't it kind of like compelling and i'm sure you think the same way too where it's kind of like the most basic of freedoms that you are accustomed to before like what the army entails th that smallest difference is kind of like wow this was stripped away from me instantaneously and they have it like they have it within their within their surroundings yeah, no. To me, it's like uh, you're not you're not installing whatever uh, whatever discipline you you they install into me, 
right? They installed into like when my father was in, my uncle, it's not going to be there, right? And I've seen it already, like during my last uh, few months, a lot of the guys that just came straight out of basic training to my unit while I was on that mission. And um, yeah, how do you, and it, they don't even discipline them the same way either. Like they get to keep their phones. And then on top of that, they're not having drill sergeants gathering around them and, you know, yelling at them, kicking their shit around and throwing things around, yeah. right? Just to install the fear and let them know who's in charge. Apparently they're not doing that no more. Now, a part of me understands it because, you know, COVID, social distancing, I get it, right? But when I was in, a drill sergeant could have been like, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm on the drill pad and he could have been like two, uh, two miles away he installed so much fear that from two miles away, he told you to drop, you dropped, right? Because oh, you didn't wow. want to know what the hell he was going to do. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, wow. So basically all these drill sergeants, they can't even do that, right? They, they start off now with, uh, like, I guess it looks like a PT test now that they have them doing. As soon as they get there, they have them line up doing pull-ups. I'm like, okay, that's not fun, but um, they, they what, what are they getting out of this, right? just still leaving room for them to like run, you know, do whatever they want and all that. And by the way, I am not in any way shit and shitting on the army. I actually did love my time in the army. It's right. just certain things I am not too, you know, thrilled about that they're doing. Yeah. And, and that's definitely understandable because in anything that you've been instilled to do, it could be the army. It could be what, whatever desires to be you're always going to have cons to kind of like rebuke and then also see how it could possibly progress from there. So it's yeah. not a fault by any means. Mm -hmm. so, so, so kind of like at that point, now you left the army in August, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Now, what I'm curious about is like fr from that point, like, uh, how do you, how does it make you feel when someone thanks you for your service? Uh, see, this is a lot. This is like a lot of vets feel this way. Depending it, I don't know. It's weird. It's like, sometimes it comes off as the most disingenuine textbook response that you can get from a, a person. Right. It just sounds like uh, it's like when people something happens to somebody and you see on Facebook, someone says thoughts and prayers. It feels sometimes kind of empty handed like that. You know, um, I, 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 I in the very beginning when I first joined and I remember they gave me a two week break between uh, Christmas and New Year's before I had to go back to basic training. Right. Um, when I got it, then it was like the ultimate compliment. Right. Because I haven't really done anything. I just been doing basic training. So yeah, it was like the ultimate compliment. But as time went on, I started to understand why my best friend who had been in for like 20 years, understand why he can't stand here and that, why his wife can't stand here in it, right? Cause it's just like, uh, it's, what is it? You, you don't really, it, it just, it doesn't really feel like, um, it doesn't feel genuine sometimes, especially with certain, when you hear it from strangers, right? And you're walking around in your uniform and yeah, sometimes it does, it, so it depends, like I said, it solely depends on who's saying it. And because of me, and I don't really think that well of people as, 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 as overall, I always think whenever I hear it, it's very disingenuous. I mean, I mean, if you said it or anybody else that we know said it, I, I know it's genuine, but like- There's a I mean, little bit of, there's a little bit of a less restrictive like barrier because there's a sense of relationship between who you know. Yeah, because I, I don't, you guys actually, you guys actually do care, right? But like, I hear like the average guy on the train or whatever tell me, and it just, it's like, what is it? You're saying this and now you feel better. You, this is the best thing you've done all day. You feel better about yourself, right? That's a good, that's a very good point because there are like, and somebody who's been working in the nonprofit field myself, this is something I can kind of emphasize with you a little bit on. I do feel like there are those like uh, cliche acts of kindness. And I'm going to put that in quotables where yeah. you feel like, okay, I did a nice deed for the day. 
what else is in it for me. And people may not say that by ver verbatim. However, though, there's going to be those instances where actions do speak louder than words. So at that point, I do kind of understand like where, where you're coming from in that, especially when you're the direct cause for the, uh, of the constituency that fights for our freedoms. Yeah, like I was explaining to, um, I was talking to my, my girlfriend once and I was explaining to her that one time you, myself and all of us, we were hanging around uh, Bay Ridge. I forgot the, that fireman, that fireman bar that they have over oh, there. Oh, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so I was hanging around over there and I think I ran out of cigarettes and I asked the guy there if I could get one. He said, no, I offered him money. He still said no. A couple of weeks later, and I'm coming from Fort Hamilton in uniform. I asked the same guy for a cigarette. He gave no it to way. me like that with no problem. He actually gave me two, right? And I was like, yeah. So the, the, when I see things like that and then people tell me, uh, uh, you know, thank you for your service. It's like, okay, so if I had mentioned to this guy that I was in the military, he probably wouldn't have cared. But now that he saw me in the uniform, now he's gonna, he thinks, you know, Okay, yeah, I'm gonna give him the two cigarettes and all that. You know, he he he's been through enough, right? It just say it's it, it, you know, I just yeah, like I said, I just it, it does bother me a lot, especially on Veterans Day. I used to, I hate hearing it so much, right? I mean, unless you actually went out and you know you got me a free meal or something like that, right? But um, you know, a lot of times it's, and it, when they had their kids do it, that's what really used to get on my nerves, right? I'm sitting on the train and. Some guy walks in there with his kids and he tells the kid, hey, say thank you for your, thank you for your service to him. You're ignorantly like passing on propaganda and talking points to yeah. a generation that wouldn't know better. Yeah, exactly. That, I really hated that a lot. Now, I'm curious about this because there is a reason why I didn't say thank you for your service. And I kind of want to bring the other side of light as far as the awareness of how soldiers actually feel. I'm curious to know if you've thought about this at all, as far as like, let's say if people do want to acknowledge the service that you have done, what are some, what, what would you recommend better case of action to be? A better case of action would be um, developing more programs for veterans. I mean, you have some out there, some of them need work, right? Um, you know, a lot of them come out, especially uh, guys that, um, that enlisted that they didn't do like what I did. I was uh, in supply, right? You have other guys that go in there, they go straight for infantry, right? Those are the ones that are on the front lines that, you know, got dodging bullets and all that. They come back here, they have PTSD problems. They have a hard time finding a job or holding a job, holding a marriage, right? And there's, yeah, there's, there's programs. Some of it are that go through the VA and all that, but they need a lot of work. And they need um, they need to be more available. There shouldn't be any you know you know any bullshit preventing them. Like they have to have this, this, and that. No, they need the help. They show the signs and everything like that. Man, you know, give it to them, right? I like that thing that they have. The hire uh, hire for heroes, I believe it's called. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about with that. Yeah, that I like that because it actually helps them. Um, translate whatever they've done in the military, put in civilian terms, because a lot of uh, jobs don't understand, you know, military lingo and all that, right? So it, it helps them out with that. And um, yeah, you know, when you're going to you want to thank somebody for your service, you know, volunteer at a VA, you know, you know, uh, volunteer at uh, there's American legions out here, you know, you got a lot of veterans there that, have, you know, they're old, some of them are young they crowds over there, you know, they could, you know, you can sit there, you know, help them out whenever they do uh, charity funds and stuff like that to help other vets, disabled vets and all that. That's to me showing um, um, you actually thanking somebody for your service, you know, you know, working with them, you know, understanding them, that's helping, uh, that's thanking somebody for their service. That's, see, the, these are, th this is the beauty of having this type of platform because when w it, there's things that you've said to me over this cast of uh, about 35 minutes, some of it I could kind of like grasp as far as where those gaps can be. Then there's other things that even for somebody like me who tries to be as open and accessible to other groups of people, 
there's things that even I would miss. And it's always nice to kind of like shed that light because some people can be more open-minded to listen. Yeah, no, like that's that's the thing, you know, you don't know something, you 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 go find out, right? You got too many people out here, you know, they don't know something, but they're gonna pretend that they do, right? And those are the dangerous people. So exactly. Now kind of kind of uh, leaping a little bit forward. So since August, you've been doing security. And I have this interesting question for you. Do you feel like with the ropes of what you've done in the army, did you feel like that was kind of like a seamless transition of doing that type of work? Actually, no, because I had actually worked security before I was in the military, yeah. right? I did it all the way in New Jersey at the Newport Mall, right? Um, I, I hadn't done any security since then. I got back into security due to my dad because my dad worked for uh, the company that I work for, right? And they just happened to, uh, I found an opening to work at the the TV studio that I work at. And um, yeah, and um, yeah, I think I, I was already like, a, I already knew how to do this job already, right? But because I'm in, you know, I'm in a news station, um, I was more alert to begin with. And I just, since I've come back, I've went back to security because I don't know if you remember, um, I actually have worked in their mailroom over there, right? That was the two and two I should have put together. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I came, I think it was like in April of last year, they offered me the mailroom job and I actually love that a lot. Right. That was so, so much easier job, right? The security, uh, you know, people drive you insane over there. Right. But um, yeah, I've come back to Sucre and I guess like within the, they actually like, I've loved working for uh, CBS. I've loved working for them, right? Because they've actually like acknowledged a lot of the hard work I put in there, which is something I never really saw a lot in a lot of the previous jobs I had, right? Even in the army, I didn't see it that much. But here they've actually taken me pretty, um, taken me very seriously. And now uh, within the past couple of months, and it, it's a shame that I'm doing it, um, they've been putting me in a lot of places that CBS had rented that are, um, they're moving out. And they had to let a lot of people mm. go, right? And uh, that's disappointing, right? And I feel I feel like really, you know, fucked up for like being like, hey, you know, uh, the subway's right next to my job. You know, I got pizza across the street. I got everything right in front of me. I'm all alone here, right? Uh, this is the greatest job in the world while people are getting their stuff and they're moving out and <laughs> after losing their jobs. So I feel like, uh, feel like a microbe sometimes when I think like that. Right. I got you. Yeah. And so something like kind of the, to that effect too, as, as I'm sure even before COVID or for the reopening phases of what you're doing, you've probably had to deal with a lot of celebrities in that approach of doing your job. I was curious to know, like, have you ever had like small talks with people if they've had the time to uh, speak with you or like, was, was there any instances of really having like some person ability with like other people of that status? Yes, only two people, right? Um, in, uh, when I worked in the mailroom, one of the areas I delivered to was um, 60 Minutes, right? Oh, okay. And um, the, one, of their, one of their correspondents, uh, I believe, yeah, Bill Whitaker, right? He, I saw him almost like every week, at least I think it was like Wednesdays or Thursdays or whatever. And um, after about four months of doing that, I started to have little small talks with him here and there, right? He actually, uh, um, he saw a couple of times, he saw, um, I had my uh, army jacket on the back of my, uh, on the back of my cart, right? And he asked me a couple of times, he was like, how did you serve? And he said, thank you for your service. And I was in, I was in one of those positions, I was like, okay. You're famous. I'm not going to make a scene. Over, I'm not going to make a scene over here. There's cameras. Right. But um, I think the nicest one I've met so far, and like this, this is the second one is Drew Barrymore. Right. Oh, wow. That's she, cool. Yeah. Because she has the show at, at our studio. Um, I've met her three times already. The first time I met her, we had like a small conversation outside and she's very, very personal. She doesn't even, she talks to you like she's not even famous at all. Right. 
And she just came up to me. She's like, hi, I'm Drew. Right. Hi, nice to meet you and all that. And I was like, that's yeah. very interesting for somebody. Yeah. That's a, see, like, I'm at, not to lose my train of thought, but it's interesting how she approached you in that way, because you've been taught your entire life to assert yourself in situations and there could there could be the chance of having that fallback based on the level of fame that you've attributed. So for her to still have that humbleness to her to her and approach you, that does that does spark a lot of like humility, even in people who've acclaimed to that stature. Yeah, and the fact that she actually the second time I met her, she actually remembered me with the mask on. Right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, she actually remembered me with the mask on the third time she remembered me. Uh, and it was the, when she remembered the third time, it was hilarious. Um, she was getting ready to start uh, shooting outside of the studio. She was going to have a barbecue. It was like in October. Right. And it was like one of those like days where it was like kind of warm. Right. So I was already outside and um, I'm smoking a cigarette. And she came by and she's she's like, I know you from someplace like that. And I'm like. I'm like, yes, you met me uh, two other times. I'm the security guard here. She goes, oh, yes, your name is Adam, right? And I'm like, it's Alex, but you're close. You got the letter right. Um, oh, the, I and, think that's, that's, that's impressive. That's very impressive. Yeah, it, it really was. And then, you know, we talked for a little bit, and I, I asked her because she had the, the guy showed up with the food and all that, and we're going to get ready to start uh, filming for them cooking the grill. I was like, oh, can I have some of that when you're done? It's just like if there's any left over, right? Um and then I came back out later on to stop people from uh, walking into where the camera is. The funniest thing, um, I'm pushing people to the side and telling them, hey, you got to go through this side to get in. Brandon Marshall, right? Oh, uh, wow. Corner, yeah, Brandon Marshall, right? He shows up from going upstairs because my area was also for Dr. Oz and inside the NFL. He came outside and he walked out and he looked right back there. And he was like, oh, man, he's like, um, <clears throat> I'm like, you, you, you know, it would actually be kind of funny if you walked in on, on set. That would actually uh, be funny. But no, don't try. And he was like, oh, man, I'll get some. I'll, I'll wait around just to get some of that food. <laughs> That's really cool, man. That, that yeah. see, they, they, I, I'm sure when you have those scenarios, it's kind of like you literally live in that moment. And that yeah. one moment is kind of like. Wow, I wish this could be a loop for me. Yeah, no, that that was just too funny. I didn't expect that at all. Um, it is, I, I just like, it's rare, like, especially now, I don't get to see that many celebrities that much anymore, right? But um, yeah, whenever they do show up, it's like the most random thing. And the thing I hate the most sometimes is um, we're not allowed, no matter what, you're not allowed to take pictures with them or anything like that, right? So I'm like, okay, I get it. Now, what happens if they cross the street, right? And I am not on building property. The, what happens then, right? Because I've seen that several times and I was still <laughs> hesitant. Uh, I still got my work shirt on. They'll know, they'll know I'm work, I work there, right? But uh, yeah, because I saw uh, that happened one time when Oscar De La Hoya showed up, right? He like walked across the street for something and I'm coming back to go back to work. And I was like, Oh, he's not on company property, so I can go ahead and you know get a picture with him. And then I, oh, I wow. I'm half, I'm, yeah, I'm halfway there. Then I notice I'm like, damn it, I'm still wearing my work shirt. Okay, let me go back. <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's really something. Uh, yeah. Is so is that kind of like more your style? Like when you see somebody, is it always like is it always kind of like the uh, the picture approach? Because it is kind of cool when you get like their first instinct as far as like, oh wow, I would love to. And then they would do something extra. Then there's the celebrities who are kind of like, oh, I don't have time, sorry. Like it's so interesting to get those like distinct differences. Yeah, like. Um... I don't know. The first instinct is to not get a picture. I just try to talk to them normally, right? Um, and I'm not going to try to draw any more attention to the fact that they're there, right? If somewhere along, like if I do get uh, get to talk to them for a little bit, if somewhere in there I may slip in, hey, you mind if I get a picture, right? That's how my approach is usually. I'm not going to just run up to them and be like, hey, can I get your picture? And all can I, I get the picture? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I saw somebody uh, was telling me, 
on Facebook. They met um, Michael C. Hall, Dexter, right? Oh, the okay. Show was yeah, he was in Manhattan. Uh, my friend met him at a bodega of all places, right? Um, the irony. She, she, she met the, she, she went up to him the same way as I do, right? She got a picture with him. As soon as he comes out of the side of the place, she said that some lady recognized him and started, uh, you know, ah, can I get you a picture? This and then a whole crowd just came around them. And I was like, yeah, see, I don't want to be that person, right? No. Because yeah, no, I start to put myself in their position. I'm like, yeah, I don't need all these people around me. Oh right. my God, that 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 is something. Like, talk about the cost of fame at certain points, where you just you estimate the value of your time, five minutes in a store, and then it's literally five times the amount based yeah. on the impact oriented around your fame. Yeah, no, it's it's why um, I've <laughs> I, I always tell my best friend this, right? Um, I've always wanted growing up and I still do to this day. I've always wanted to get in the film industry. I've always wanted to act. Right. Yeah. And I told my best friend, I said, you know what? Um, if I ever do make it that high up in the, you know, in the film industry, I'm hiring you as my, my personal bodyguard. And uh, it's going to be written in your contract that um, if you have to, you're going to beat everybody with clubs. Right when they start crowding around oh me, all right. I can, I, yeah, I cannot. Uh, yeah, I, I am not going to deal with that at all. Right, there's no barricades, nothing to separate me from anybody, whatever. Um, and then, then after uh, what's been going on uh, lately with like uh, people getting attacked randomly in the street and all that. Uh, what was it? Rick Moranis got attacked randomly. Oh, uh, that was ridiculous. That was so yeah. crazy. Yeah, like that, right? And my best friend told me, he said, you know, um, he's like, if I just happen to like see that and I'm in my car, I'm running the guy over, all right? If, if, if someone tries to attack you like that, I'm just going to run his ass over, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, it, it just, that that's the one part of the being famous that that does bother me and people don't realize. I'm like, yeah, you know, they, and at the end of the day, they're still regular people that have lives, right? And uh, it's, it, yeah, they'll take time for you, but you have to watch how you do it. And yeah, they're like, you're, they're going to have bad times and good times just like we do. So to kind of sum up everything we talked about, and you kind of already answered my question about the chance of reliving life and doing something different. Now, of course, I'm sure you know what the hero's journey is in, a, in the subject of many films. What do you think the hero's journey concept means to your life? Uh, hmm. I don't know because nine times out of 10, I don't think of myself as the hero. Right. And it's kind of, and I'm sure a lot of people kind of share that because no one wants to be voluntarily putting themselves on the pedestal, but also going through the motions of certain things. You're kind of like, wow, I feel like I'm really in the moment of doing something greater than what I'm capable, what I would think I'm capable of. Yeah, well, you see, it's it's weird because I've always thought of myself. Honestly, I've always thought of myself as the villain, <laughs> right? <laughs> I always had no. It, it, it's the truth. I always thought of myself as the villain. I um, I have a tendency to not so much now these days, but uh, because I have a tendency to just not you know just disregard people. Right. Especially if I don't find anything about you that I can actually, you know, um, that's going to be a benefit to me and I'm not going to waste my time with you. And I will go as far as to ruining whatever you have right now, if that means I can move up further. As time went on, I started to come to the realization that, you know, the people that you step on on the bottom. Right. Um, once you get up to the top, if you, you know, you fuck up, and you get knocked back down, those same people are going to be waiting for you. So I've kind of changed my approach to things a little bit. Um, I'd say my hero's journey, if anything, would be um, marrying this, marrying this uh, nice young lady to the left of me, right? Um, and you know, me ha having some kids, and uh, but uh, I still want. I'm still not gonna give up on the uh, the dream of actually. Uh, you know, make it in the film industry. 
doing something. You know, I've always wanted to, uh, I don't, I'm not looking to win like Academy Awards and shit like that. I don't think I have the ability to do that, but definitely uh, to see me jumping off of rooftops, gunning bad guys down and, uh, you know, on the big screen and all that. That's what I've always wanted to do and to do my own stunts. Unless, of course, the stunt requires me to go 90 feet up into the sky because I hate the heights, right? I could never get over that. Even the army couldn't even pur purge that from me, right? But, yeah, that's it. My hero's journey at the very end is just to um, make, you know, make the life for myself I've always wanted. And those who support me, right, uh, never gonna, I'm not going to forget you, especially you. Right? I love you, too. Right? <laughs> I'm not talking to you, Jerry. <laughs> you mean we weren't going to do a virtual hug at the end of this? Come on, Alex. This was like, such you know, a great interview. Yeah, I know. It was such a great <laughs> interview. There's no camera in it. This is, uh, this is messed up. <laughs> well, we could always work that out in post. But nonetheless, yeah. Alex, thank you for being such a wonderful guest for The Chain Within. And as for everybody, the background speaks for itself. You can find what we do on Anchor, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at the Change Within Podcast. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.